and I have the joy of opening the Word of God with you and speaking from it. We're going to be in the book of Ephesians as we're continuing. So if you've got a Bible with you or your phone, please do get that out. It's also going to be up on the screen. Uh, we're in this sermon series, and I get to say we, which is a lovely thing to be able to do. And um, considering the, the church that God is building, the kind of people he's called us to be together and what he's doing. So I'm going to read from Ephesians 4, verse 17, until 5, chapter 2. So I tell you this, writes Paul, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They're darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they're full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Christ Jesus. You were taught, with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you, Central Church, must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we're all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who's been stealing must steal, must, must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Let's pray together, shall we? God, thank you for your word. We pray that you'd speak to us today. And we thank you for today and that we're together. We pray that you'd move among us now. Amen. Amen. Uh, this is such a joy to be here. Uh, thank you for all the prayers you just prayed for me. And um, we're just gonna jump right in. There's lots more that can be said about me, this church, where we're going, all of that. But let's just jump right into the word of God. And the first thing I want to point out is that on Thursday, for those of you who were there, you'll have seen me in this, and there's a picture coming up. We had our Anglican licensing service, and I wore something that I've only worn a few times in my life when I was ordained, which happens twice, and then on this night. I wore the traditional Anglican, it's called choir dress. Don't I look lovely? <laughs> yes, I do. Um, I'll be honest, it makes me feel a bit self-conscious, but it felt very appropriate for the service. There you can see the bishop in her garb with a hat, which I think is called a mitre. And we had our service, so we had formal bits of liturgy as well as songs and prayers and so on. And if you like, I was dressed like that, not because I really, this was my heart's desire, you know, this is how I would like to really begin my ministry here at Central Church, um, but because I was dressing in a way that was appropriate for being a vicar in the Church of England. I had a dog collar on and I was wearing the robes because that's what you do when you're a vicar at a formal licensing service. And if you like, Christians are commanded to dress in a certain way too. Christians are commanded to live in a certain way. Paul puts it like this in verse 22. You are taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. What Paul is saying here is to dress in a way that is appropriate for being a child of God. Dress for success, if you like. So just as I dressed as a vicar, because that was appropriate on Thursday evening, so Christians are to do the same thing. To help us visualize this, you might have been wondering what on earth these two t-shirts were about. Well, let me show you. 
So hopefully you can see the difference between them. And what I thought I'd represent, do is represent Clapham. This says Clapham Saints on it, which is a sporting group at HTC. Paul says that you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. It's how you're to dress, he says, but really he's talking about a way of life. Put off your former way and put on the new thing that God has for you. And the key thing to note here, let's just state it right from the off, we don't receive a new life in Jesus Christ by being good people, do we? As in, we don't earn the holiness of God, the righteousness of God, his forgiveness, his love. We don't earn that by being good people, do we? Instead, when we come to God through faith and we say sorry for everything we've ever done, God, in all his mercy, in all his grace, in all his goodness, forgives us and washes us totally clean. And I've represented that today with a T-shirt that says saints on it. God has given you a new self. He's caused you to be born again when you became a Christian. When you trusted in him, he came to live in you by his Holy Spirit. But what we all need to do is actually live like that's true. That's the point of this passage. We need to live in accordance with God, what God's actually done. You see, we had a former way of life. I muddied this T-shirt on the ground outside. It's quite muddy in the car park, so it was very, very helpful for me. We had a former way of life before we met God. And what we need to do when we become Christians is put that aside and put on what God has for us. Verse 24 says this, you could look at it in your Bible, that we've been created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And thankfully, we don't just get you know, the command here, we also get some examples. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through the passage and we're gonna look at the examples together and they're gonna come up on the screen. Firstly, what does it mean to put off the old self and put on the new self? Look at verse 25. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for you're all members of one body. Put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for all members of one body. So get rid of lying and tell the truth. With your mouth, speak the truth. Put off falsehood, put off deception, put off uh, deceiving others. I mean, do you ever tell a, a little white lie? No, of course you don't, because you're all perfect and holy. Sometimes I might. Well, you just slightly distort it, don't you? Maybe you don't tell the whole truth. We are to get rid of that way of life, and instead put on, uh, truth, put on speaking truthfully. And notice, look, the, look at the end of verse 25, for we are all members of one body. So if you like, falsehood undermines this fellowship that we have. We've created to be together and we need to be uh, moving in the truth. Secondly, look at verse 26. We're not to lose our temper, but to ensure that if we are angry, it's righteous. Verse 26, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. And when Paul writes this, he's actually echoing the Psalms. It's a Hebrew idiom. Do not let the sun go down uh, while you're still angry. And it might be a bit confusing to us because we'll read that and then just later on it's gonna say, get rid of all anger. So what's going on? And it's saying, do not lose self-control to such a point that you would end up sinning. And there's nothing like anger to cause us to shift and to act, cause us to act in a way that we might not have previously wanted to. When you think about Jesus' anger in the temple with those uh, people who have been selling things, what did he do? He cleared them, he flipped the tables over. There was a kind of righteous anger there. But we're not to sin in our anger. Thirdly, look at verse 28. We're no longer to steal, but to work and give. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. I hope you can see the pattern here with every single one of these things. So let me just illustrate it again. What does Paul say? If you've been stealing, well, that was part of your former way of life. Get rid of it. And instead, what's he able to put on? Your work. Do something useful. Do something profitable. 
And then notice again, just at the end of the verse, it's all about living in community, that they may have something to share with those in need. So get rid of a kind of selfish way of life that you just took whatever you can get with your own two hands. Put on working in a profitable way of life that, so you can give to others. Fourthly, we're not to use our mouths for evil, but for good. Let's look at verse 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. Do you ever swear? No, me neither, never. Do you ever gossip? No, of course, again, of course not, of course not. Do you ever say something in anger? Are you ever harsh to your spouse or your children? Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. Again, can you see the pattern? Get rid of your former way of life, which included all saying all kinds of things, and put on the new way, which is speaking in a way only what is helpful for building others up. Again, can you see how relational it is? When you speak, it's to be for the benefit of other people. And don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God, he says. And we'll come back to that in just a minute. Fifthly, here's his other example. We're not to be unkind or bitter, but kind and loving. Look at verse 31. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Can you see the pattern again? Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger. And if you just focus on that word bitterness there for a second, bitterness can be very, very poisonous to us and to our walk with the Lord. Bitterness gets right at the root of who you are. You can be bitter about someone else or something they've done. Well, maybe that's the best way to sum it up, actually. Bitterness, especially in what can happen to you in your life from what other people do to you, maybe what they've said to you. This is where um, unforgiveness spills over. Or maybe we're bitter just because our life hasn't worked out the way it should. And we're to get rid of it. That was your former way of life, says Paul. And instead, what are we to do? To put on being kind and compassionate. Again, can you see how relational it is? Combined and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. So in all of these, I hope you can really see the pattern. I'm probably laboring the point and you've got it already. Put off the old self and put on the new self. Now, do you know that little phrase, uh, dress for the job you want? Ever come across that? I guess that's what I was doing on Thursday. You know, I want to be the vicar here. Bishop, please, I'm going to wear the robes. I'm going to be a good boy. But this isn't, in our case, and as Christians, dress for, you know, dress for the job you want. If you like, it's dress for the job you already have. God has already provided for you a new way of life. He's already forgiven you. He's already wiped your record clean. He's already taken you from darkness to light. He's already washed you. We need to appropriate it into our own life. I think of verses like um, from Romans 6 where Paul says, reckon yourselves to be dead to sin and alive to Christ. Now that isn't reckon like a farmer saying, you know, I reckon you're gonna take the tractor up the road. He's saying, reckon yourself as in, thank you. <laughs> it wasn't that funny. <laughs> reckon yourself to be dead to sin and alive to Christ. Live out the actual truth that's actually happened in your actual life. God has already done this, he's already forgiven you. Now live like it's true. Put off the old self. That is dead and gone and put on the new self that God has provided for you. God has made us of one body, so put on truth in us. He's given us freedom, so don't lose control and sin in your anger. God's met our needs, so provide for others and don't seal. God has sealed us with the Holy Spirit, so speak wholesomely. God has forgiven us, so put on compassion and forgiveness of others. And I think it is all summed up best at the start of chapter five. If you want a lovely verse for your life this week, the season of life you're in, look at verse one of chapter five. Follow God's example, Central Church, therefore as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. If you want, if you like, all those examples that Paul's just given can be summed up like this. Live a life of love. Live a life of love. And I wonder where God would wanna to speak to you today about what you need to put off and what you need to put on. Because it might be different for all of us. 
And I don't think those examples that he gives there are exhaustive. I think they're just examples. You know, he's writing to the community in Ephesus, he's thinking about that church. But as you think about your own life, what do you need to get rid of? What do you need to put on? You know what I really wanna get rid of in my own life? Is self-reliance. Particularly as I come to this new role, I don't wanna be trying to do it just in my own strength. You see, that, was, that, w- that would've been my life before I met God. Well, I'm the center of my own universe, basically. If I want something to happen, you know, I need to rely on me. God's with me, he's with you. I've received his strength. I've got his mercy that's new every morning. So I wanna live like that's true. I wonder what it is for you. I wonder where the Lord might just wanna point out something in your life and say, that's not who you are anymore. I've got something new for you. I've got a new way for you to live. In um, Galatians, when Paul's writing, in chapter five, Paul writes, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh, rather to serve one another humbly in love. And this is one of the temptations we might have. You see, uh, this wonderful thing happens, as I've already explained, when we come to meet the Lord, right? We're forgiven of all our sin, We're given a new way of life, we're given a new start, our slate is wiped clean. But the very key thing is that that doesn't mean that we can just do whatever we like. Are you ever tempted to think, if you've sinned or you've done something, you think, well, it's okay, because I know God will forgive me. Are you ever tempted to think like that? No, me neither. We're all so, aren't we all good? Brilliant. I never think like that either. Sometimes we can be tempted to cheapen the grace of God. And sometimes we get tempted to think, well, you know, in the end, it doesn't really matter necessarily how I live because of this grace that I've received. Even if we know that to be true, we can end up sort of living like that's true. And there's some raising encouraging things here from this passage, but there's also a couple of warnings, possible discouragements, things for us to consider. So we're gonna see that there are some consequences to us not living in the way that God has called us to be. Let's read verse 26 and verse 27 again, shall we? In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. In your anger, do not sin. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. Now, when Tim and I were talking about Bible passages for this sermon series, here I am. I might not have necessarily chosen to talk about the devil, on my first Sunday as the vicar. Because it's quite punchy, isn't it? Who is the devil? What does that even mean? And the key thing for us here would be is it's possible for there to be uh, the influence of the evil one in our life. Paul says you to put off your old self, you to put on the new self. Don't sin, don't be angry. Don't give the devil a foothold in your life. What on earth does that mean? Well, it means that we can just become, we can become people who uh, the enemy, the evil one, can just have a little bit of influence over, a little bit more influence over. What does the devil do? He lies. He tells untruths. And the danger is that as we give into sin more and more, we might just start listening to what he has to say to us. Are you really a child of God? Has God really forgiven you? He might attack you on identity. He might tempt you, and then he might accuse you for doing the thing that he tempted you to do. Oh, you're pathetic. There you are again, you've given into that thing that you always do. Why have you done that? And what Paul says is we're not to be those people who give the devil a foothold. We can just say, hey, you've got no hold of me. I'm forgiven, I'm a child of God. There's another Very strong challenge here. Let's look at verse 30. Not only can we give the devil a foothold potentially, but we can grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Again, if I was choosing to preach, maybe I wouldn't have talked about grieving the Holy Spirit, but it's the word of God, so let's address it. We are children of a God who loves us so much. You are his. If you've trusted in Jesus Christ today, you are his. And the Holy Spirit has come to live in you. 
but it is possible to live in such a way that we grieve the Lord. The Holy Spirit, who is holy. How often have you ever wandered into church or a prayer meeting or come to your quiet time and you just sort of rock up and go, Lord, bless me, or you're singing songs of worship and then you just feel the conviction of God. Maybe just, hey, you just need to ask for forgiveness for that. I do it. I can be far too casual sometimes when I approach God. And what we do is we have to hold together this thing. If I'm totally forgiven by grace, I have received a new self by God. God has forgiven me. And yet, when I'm living with the old way, that grieves the Lord. And I can actually grieve the Holy Spirit. So one of the things that happens, and we need to be really careful, is that we don't uh, live in such a way that we lose a sight of what we've had, sorry, of what we've gone from and what we have now. Look at verse 17. I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They're darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Don't pull any punches, Paul. Having lost all sensitivity, they've given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity and they're full of greed. Just we've got the triple whammy of quite punchy things here. We've got the devil, we've got grieving the Holy Spirit, and then we've got a pretty strong description of people who aren't Christians. Can you see that? The Gentiles, he means those people who haven't met God. He says, there's loftal sensitivity. They've given themselves over to greed. They're indulgent. They do whatever they like. And I think this, is, this verse does not give us, if, um, if we're Christians, we have no right to judge anybody, do we? Because this is a description of everybody before they meet Jesus Christ. And what it tells us is that we need to be woken up, that we are dead in our sins and transgressions, as Ephesians 1 will say. And it's like when he describes these Gentiles here, he says they're darkened in their understanding, they're separated from the life of God, and he said they've ignorant, they're hardened, and they've lost all sensitivity. It's like they don't even realize the state they're in. When you think about people you know who don't yet know Jesus, pray for them to be awoken up, to see their state. But the danger is for us is, as Christians, is we receive this new way of life. The Lord says to you today, live a life of love, be a person of love, and yet we continually go back to our old ways. And the danger is that you go back to your old ways again and again and again, you lose sight of that. And if you like, your senses become dulled. And I want you to imagine for me that uh, you have just gone, uh, you've done some kind of exercise and maybe it's been raining or maybe you've fallen down a hill and you've got very, very muddy. Maybe you just, you know, that'd be a pretty, that'd be a bad thing, wouldn't it? Now you go home, what do you want to do? You've been cold and wet, what do you want to do? Nice cup of tea, maybe get in the bath or have a shower and you get warm and you dry off. Now, wouldn't it be absolutely disgusting after that to put your clothes that you were just wearing back on? Wouldn't that be a bit grim? You know, wet, cold, smelly. Maybe you've stepped in some dog poo. Oh, that'd be awful, wouldn't it? Oh, I'm gonna put those shoes straight back on. Ugh, in my own house. Ugh. We do the same thing. We do the same thing. When we go back to our sin again and again and again, and we lose sight of the kind of stench of it, if you like, the, the muckiness of it, the muddiness of it. And we become just like these Gentiles that Paul describes. He says, having lost all sensitivity. And maybe that is where we are at today. And maybe there is just something in your life that you need to seek forgiveness for. And actually, God just wanna point out to you today that you also need to have your senses woken up to it. Ask God for the grace to be the kind of person that never grieves him, that never loses sight of what he's given you and what he's called you to. I don't want, I don't want to do it with, say, self-reliance. I want to do it as I rely on God. And um, the reason, if you like, for all of this uh, is the cross. Why should we do all this? Why should we put on the new self and put off the old self? Why should we live a life of love? Well, it's because of the example of Jesus Christ, isn't it? 
We're gonna take communion together today. And when we take communion together, what we have the chance to do is to come before God and to remember Jesus Christ. To remember his body that was broken for us on the cross. To remember his blood that was shed. I wonder when you became a Christian. I'm aware that as I've given this sermon today, there aren't many stories in there, but let me just tell you briefly. I became a Christian when I was five years old. And I just had a bath, and I was in bed, and I said to mum, mum, I wanna become a Christian. And we prayed a little prayer. And there, from as far as I'm concerned, that's when I became a Christian. Now, maybe the Lord was at life in my work before that, and he's certainly been at work in my life after that. And what I wanna come back to again and again and again, whether I'm five years old, 55 years old, is I wanna come back to the cross. For the rest of my life and my ministry, Because on the cross, what God does for all of us is he takes our old selves. You see, Jesus on the cross took your old way of life. He took your sin, he took your shame, he took your brokenness, and he wore it on himself. Just like someone who's spotless and clean and warm, putting back on those old clothes, so Jesus, in all his holiness and purity, bore your sin. The one who is perfect and holy and righteousness, took your sin. And so a great exchange could happen so that God could say to you, you can be born again. Here's a new life. You're forgiven. And what Jesus calls you to do today is to put on the thing that he has provided for you. Jesus said, I've paid for this with my body and with my blood. So will you wear it? Will you live that life of love that I've called you to? Will you put off the old self? It's stinky and dirty. You don't need to live that way anymore. That's not who you are. Will you put on the new self that I've given for you? Amen. Amen. Why don't we pray together? We're gonna sing a song of worship, but as, I, as the band come up, let's pray. Lord God, what good news this is. And it might seem heavy and, and very real when we consider the concepts of sin and the, de- the devil and all of that, Lord. But we just, we just know that it's such a joyful thing that you offer us. You offer us new life. Thank you that those who have trusted in you are a new creation. And so, Lord, we pray to you now as we come to you in worship and as we take communion, you would help us put off the way we've been going and put on and rejoice in, celebrate, thank you for the new thing you've given us. Amen. So why don't we stand together as we're able, the band again.